That was so nice. Well, welcome. I'm so happy to be uh, part of this wonderful fusion of art and science. Uh, Darwin provided an answer to the question, who are we, that shocked the world 150 years ago? We are the product of the same evolutionary forces that shaped the rest of the world on Earth. And you'd think that by now, 150 years later, we might have a clear idea of what this means. Uh, but that is emphatically not the case. Our understanding of the uh, biological world has been revolutionized many times over, and yet, for complex reasons, studying our own nature from an evolutionary perspective is largely declared off limits for most of the 20th century. Like Sleeping Beauty, the question, who are we, was cursed to fall into a 100-year-long sleep. The most disturbing fact about public awareness of evolution is not that 50% of Americans don't believe in theory, but that nearly 100% have no idea how to connect it to their own everyday lives. Now, while all of this is rapidly changing, our sleeping beauty has been kissed and is madly begetting children with their prints, uh, virtually every aspect of humanity is now being explored from an evolutionary perspective, mostly within the last 10 or 15 years. And at the end of my book, Evolution for Everyone, I say the following, I say, uh, I sometimes wonder what it must have been like to have been present during the early days of Darwin's theory when the idea was so new and so much remained to be discovered. Then I realized that I am present during the early days of Darwin's theory. <laughs> <laughs> the intellectual events taking place right now are as foundational as the events of 150 years ago. How amazing that virtually everyone can partake in the excitement as an observer or a participant. Now, one of these exciting events that Mary picked up upon in the theme of her first piece involves the study of personality, which certainly bears upon the question of who are we. So go outside and you'll see thousands of species that all coexist by surviving and reproducing in different ways. It turns out that the same kind of diversity exists in miniature within each species, like the kind of computer art where the same patterns repeat themselves at every scale, it turns out that within a single species, individuals also coexist by doing, by surviving and reproducing in different ways, just as species coexist in uh, ecosystems. And we recognize this as having different personalities, but as for us, so also for thousands of other non-human species, great and small. Our, uh, one of the first people to realize this, to fully appreciate this, was my wife and colleague sitting in the audience, Anne Clark. Uh, as a newly minted PhD in the 1970s, conducting field work in South Africa on the nocturnal primate called Gallido crestidatus, whose common name is the thick tailed bush baby, <laughs> Anne was now following these animals at night with little with headlamps, and one female. In her uh, study site, she had been given the name of Diana. Uh, bush babies have more than one offspring, but as many as two or three offspring. And Diana had two daughters named Maria and Vera. So there they were, they had the same mother, they were born in the same patch of forest, uh, but their personalities were as different as night and day. Uh, Maria was confident and outgoing, made friends with the other bush babies in the forest, and before long had established her own home range in preparation for a life of her own. There it was nervous and clinging, reluctant to leave her mother's side, and in fact never left home, remaining with Diana to raise her next brood and perhaps to inherit the same home range after her mother had passed away. The comparison with human adventurers and home bodies could not be more clear, and yet the bush babies provided an ecological context. We and Vera's personality enabled them to survive and reproduce in different ways, much as species occupy different niches at a larger scale. And our next opportunity to study personality was on a completely different creature, and right up here in Ithaca, uh, New York, on those wonderful fish that inhabit our ponds and lakes, the pumpkin seed sunfish. This was work we did with our graduate student, Christine Coleman. Many of you must have fished for these little fish um, uh, when you were uh, children, or even now, or if you uh, remain childlike in your ways. <laughs> so imagine that you go out to the, to the shore of a pond or a stream, and you toss in some minnow traps, as we did, just shiny, funnel-shaped traps, no food in them at all, and here they plunge into the water, and there are the pumpkin seeds along the shore, and they scatter. But within minutes, some of them are back, and they're exploring this novel object, and they're sucked into the trap just by their curiosity. So after 10 minutes, we pull out these traps, and then we take a seine, a long net, 
and we sweep the same section of shoreline and we catch the fish that didn't go into the traps. And then we keep them separate in the laboratory and we study them and we find out that they're very, very different from each other. Among other things, the fish that we caught in the traps acclimate to the laboratory conditions five days sooner than the fish captured in the same. Now, if you're a scientist, you must be critical. There's a, a flaw in this experiment. It's possible that the reason that these fish are so different from each other is because the experience of being sane is traumatic. And so these fish were actually the same in the pond, but the traumatic event of being sane caused them to experience post-traumatic stress disorder in the lab. <laughs> and so what do you do is to, uh, to solve this problem? Well, we repeated this experiment, but then we took the trapped fish and we put them in a seine, and we folded the seine over so we could still keep them, and we dragged them up and down the lake saying things like, you are going to die, you are going to die. <laughs> and we repeated the experiment, and the difference remained. And so these fish were, were, in, were different in ways that we would recognize as shy and bold and human uh, turds. And this uh, research uh, like this is now being conducted on dozens of species, uh, from hyenas to black widow spiders, and if you don't believe me, check out the uh, current issue of Science News with a picture of a black widow spider and the title, Got Personality? Why Researchers Looking Beyond People. <laughs> now, another individual difference concerns not shyness and boldness, but the degree to which we process the information around us. And this wonderful topic is uh, being explored by another husband and wife scientific team, Elaine and Arthur Aaron. <coughs> Now, information processing is a mixed blessing. Too little gets us into trouble, but too much can overwhelm us. And it turns out that this trade-off is managed very differently by different people. Individuals differ profoundly in how they manage this trade-off. Some people are inattentive louts who bulldoze their way through life, while others go the way of the neurotic, forever examining their predicament and agonizing over what to do. And these personalities also exist without the animal world. There are even highly sensitive pigs. <laughs> E.B. White knew what he was talking about. <laughs> I'm Charlotte Webb. And as one of our colleagues studies uh, this individual difference in pigs, and Hannah and I were at a conference and we saw this memorable video showing two pigs, both of which have been learned around a tea maze. A tea maze is very simple. It's a little corridor which you run up. You can turn left or right. And both of these pigs have learned that the food was to the left. And so first it shows them, they let out of their cage, they barrel up the first corridor, they turn left, they go to the food, they know exactly what to do. And the experimental manipulation is to take an overturned bucket and to put it in their pad, just after they're going to make the turns, an overturned bucket as a novel object. So, the first pig runs up the corridor, turns left, looks at the bucket, says, whatever, barrels past it, and gets to the food. That was the insensitive block. <laughs> Runs up the corridor, turns left, sees the bucket, and says, whoa! And it looks, and it looks, and it looks, and then finally it kind of edges past the bucket. <laughs> it finally goes to the uh, food. It is just um, um, Amazing the differences between these individuals, which has also been documented again in all features, uh, great and uh, and uh, and small. Now it's worth asking at this point whether we should feel threatened by these new scientific discoveries. After all, we're all sort of uh, um, uh, aware of the concept of genetic determinism. What does it mean to have our behaviors coded by our uh, genes? Is this something that we should be worried about? And I'd like to uh, read a little passage from Evolution for Everyone uh, on this topic. Um, Should we feel threatened by the prospect that some aspects of our personality are defined by our genes or very early in our development? That one person might find it difficult to take life by the horns, and another might find it equally difficult to be overwhelmed by a symphony? I think I know how a late Aaron would answer this question. She's a practicing psychotherapist in addition to her academic career and has gathered a large follower of highly sensitive people through her books, workshops, and website, where you can take a simple test to discover if you are a highly sensitive person. Just like that highly sensitive person uh, in Google when you get there. <laughs> in plain language, if anyone can understand, she explains that the trait is normal, is present in about 15 to 20% of the population, and exists in about the same proportion of other species. 
It is a great gift that can also be a liability in some situations. It is especially misunderstood in our own culture, which values toughness and regards extreme sensitivity as abnormal. It's easier to be a highly sensitive person in Asia. Readers who were quoted at the beginning of a book, a highly sensitive person, were anything but threatened. You put into clear and understandable words what I have always known about myself. I cannot thank you enough for the inner peace your book has given me. It has really made me feel like part of a larger group and not quite so weird after all. I find it, this is now me talking, I find it even more important to contemplate that this larger group includes not only highly sensitive people, but highly sensitive creatures, great and small. Now, uh, another, yet another individual difference that uh, concerns cooperation and exploitation. In countless species, from microbes to humans, enormous benefits can be achieved by working together as a team. Yet teamwork is inherently vulnerable to individuals who pursue their own interests at the expense of other members of their groups. And this trade-off, which we conceptualize in moral and ethical terms as the battle between good and evil, also pervades the rest of the living world. Before I continue our scientific story, uh, why don't we turn back to the medium of art? <laughs> 